Well, last week we started our uh, journey toward Calvary and then ultimately Easter Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection. And uh, we were in the upper room last week and we're still in the upper room this week. Last Sunday I asked you the question, if you only had... Uh, if you knew it was the last day of your life, what would you do? This question is even a little more uh, narrow. If you knew you had a few hours left in your life to talk to the people who were closest to you, what, what would you say? You know you only have a few hours left and you gather your family and those closest to you. What were the things, would be the things that you would want to say to them? Well, we know what Jesus said to those who were closest to him on earth, because now we're in the upper room. Judas, the betrayer, has left. We saw how Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper that we observed last Sunday. And now he has these 11 men who are literally going to be used by him to change the world. And he has these last hours with them. And they're still in the upper room when he teaches them here in John chapter 14. If you look at verse 25, he says, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you. Because he knows in a few hours he will be in Gethsemane and then he'll be arrested and all of that will ultimately lead to his crucifixion. So what is it that he wants to talk to his disciples about in these very key remaining moments? Someone has said that last words are lasting words. And certainly all the words of Jesus are lasting words, but these take on a little more importance in a certain sense. One of the key subjects that Jesus spoke to his disciples that night about was the coming of the Holy Spirit. In verse 15, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. This idea of if I love him, I will keep his commandments is a theme that really runs not only through scripture and the gospels and the New Testament, but in this section here, it really sort of sets the tone for what Jesus is about to teach them. Now, we know that Peter wanted to prove his love for the Lord. Peter was willing to die for him. We know later on he'll, draw, uh, he'll have a sword and he'll try to defend Jesus with the sword. And I think that Peter would have loved to go out in a blaze of glory and give his life to defend his Savior. But Jesus has something far more difficult for Peter to do and for all the disciples to do, and that is to live daily for him. You think about the culture they lived in, which is very similar to the culture we now live in. We understand that all of us, even though if we're saved, we know the Lord, we still have that old nature, and we all have the sinful nature, whether you're saved or not, we're all born with it. I just saw one of our members in the hallway with a beautiful baby girl, and it's hard to believe when you look at this precious life that this is, is a little sinner. And now she's mad at me, her mother, but um, <laughs> wait till she's two, then you'll have proof verified. But, you know, I love my children and my grandchildren, but, you know, they're, we're all sinners. It's very evident that we are sinners. The Bible says, David said, we go from the womb speaking lies. So how is it in the midst of this culture that you and I live in, you know, let alone how could the disciples uh, live for him and change the world, how in the world can we be followers of Jesus and really follow him in all of life and be faithful to him and keep his commandments? How is that possible? Well, it's possible because of what Jesus taught them that evening. And what he taught them about was the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 16. I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Understanding the person and work of the Holy Spirit is vital to your Christian life if you're going to be a victorious Christian and live for the Lord in this world. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of misunderstanding about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. There's been a lot of extremism when it comes to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that's unfortunate because the biblical information on the Holy Spirit is really extensive. Even in the Old Testament, there's 86 references to him. And the very first reference to the Holy Spirit in the Bible is the second verse of the Bible, Genesis 1-2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, 
and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So right there at the beginning, we see this individual called the Holy Spirit. The New Testament has 261 passages that refer to him. And the very last reference is the last chapter in the last book of the Bible, Revelation 22:17. 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who thirsts come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So it ends with an invitation, and the Holy Spirit, along with the Son of God, is involved in that invitation, calling sinful people to himself. So who or what is the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is a unique divine person, a unique divine person. Notice how Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit in verse 17, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now, no translation gets it right every time, and the King James Version has Holy Ghost, which has caused some confusion about the identity of the Holy Spirit. Jesus spoke of him as a person, as a person. In fact, in the Greek language here, he even uses the masculine pronoun, even though the Greek word spirit is neuter. Jesus also uses the term another in verse 16. I will give you, an, he will give you another helper, another comforter. The word another means one of the same kind. And Jesus understands that he is about to leave them. The situation they've had with him for almost three years is his bodily visible presence is going to change. He's going to go to the cross. He's going to die and be buried. Yes, he will rise from the dead. And yes, he will come back and show himself alive for a period of 40 days. And he will be with them for a time and leave them and be with them. And then ultimately, they will see him ascend to heaven. So Jesus is preparing them for life and ministry after he has gone back to heaven. And how can they accomplish and how can they obey his commands? How can we obey his commands? Because of the promise of the Holy Spirit the divine person of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says he's the spirit of truth, so he's going to guide us into all truth, and he calls him the helper. That's that compound word that means called alongside to help. Uh, it's translated sometimes helper, sometimes comforter. It's a word for comfort or encouragement. But it's the kind of word that the English, one English word can't really give you the full meaning. It's a word that means comforter, counselor, exhorter, advocate, encourager. Now, notice this, the Holy Spirit is not merely a force or an influence or an emanation. We don't go around as Christians saying, may the force be with you. We don't say that because the Holy Spirit is not a force. He's not just a, some kind of nebulous presence out there. The Holy Spirit is a person. And the Holy Spirit is of the same quality and of the same character as Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is co-equal with God the Father and God the Son. So we can't, how do we wrap our minds around one God, three persons? How do we wrap our minds around the fact that God is a spirit, yet at the same time, Christ came and took on a human body, a true humanity, and he was resurrected in that humanity. And so the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And what Jesus is saying is, this coming Holy Spirit will be everything to you that I have been to you. So what does he promise them? Well, Jesus promised them the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He promised his disciples the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. David prayed a prayer in the Old Testament, take not your Holy Spirit or your spirit from me. No New Testament believer need pray that prayer. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people for special deeds and such. But something changed in the New Testament. Now we have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 18. Jesus says to them, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. I'm not going to abandon you is what he's saying. Look at verse 16. That he may abide with you forever. He identifies the Holy Spirit and he says he's going to abide with you forever. Verse 17. He dwells with you, that's present tense. He will be in you, that's future tense. 
And Jesus spoke of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit at that point in the upper room in future tense because it would not be until the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 that the Holy Spirit would come and be permanently indwell all disciples of Jesus, all believers, all Christians. Now, Jesus had spoke of the Holy Spirit before this in the Gospel of John, John chapter 7. He said, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, future tense, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So the point was, it wasn't until after his death, burial, resurrection, after his post-resurrection appearances, after his ascension back to heaven, and then 10 days later on the Feast of Pentecost, a preordained event that God sent the Holy Spirit. And from that moment on, the Holy Spirit permanently indwells every person who believes in Jesus Christ and who trusts Christ as Savior and who is a disciple, a follower of the Lord Jesus. Now, the Apostle Paul in particular really expands on this in the New Testament. And he does a lot of teaching about the Holy Spirit. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit occurs at the moment of salvation. Now, Jesus even alluded to this in John chapter 3 when he told Nicodemus, a, a religious person, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Born again means born from above. It means the Holy Spirit is active in our salvation. Now in theology, this is how we describe it. The Holy Spirit is the agent of regeneration. He is the agent of regeneration. The whole trinity is involved with our salvation. God the Father saves us based on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And the Holy Spirit is the one who makes that personal in each individual's lives. It is the Holy Spirit's presence that gives us a new heart. It's the Holy Spirit is the one who regenerates us. Uh, Titus 3 verses 5 and 6. It is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, regeneration is a compound word from the word born and again. So regeneration in essence means what Jesus said in John 3, born again. You cannot be born again by baptism. You cannot be born again by church membership or by doing some kind of good works. The Bible says it is not by works of righteousness which we have done. And when it talks about renewing and regeneration and washing, it's not talking about baptism there. He's using that illustration. It's the Holy Spirit who cleanses us, who cleanses us from our sin. It's the presence and ministry of the Holy Spirit. He regenerates the believing sinner he baptizes them, placing them into the body of Christ and into Christ. He indwells them and he seals them. He ensures our salvation by his very presence. He is the seal. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a once for all time event, a divine action by God, a declarative act of God in which he justifies us, he declares us righteous, and he puts us in Christ, and he puts us in the body of Christ. It's a one-time event. You can't seek for it. There's no commandment for us to seek it. It's something that occurs at the moment of our salvation. And the Holy Spirit is the seal, Ephesians 4.30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What's the day of redemption? It's the day when you stand before the Lord. It's the day when you receive that glorified body. And the Holy Spirit is our guarantee that I know that I know if I die today, I'd go to heaven because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. And these are all solely acts of God. The fact that he baptizes us, that he indwells us, that he seals us, that he regenerates us. We can't do that. Only God can do that. All we do is by faith believe the gospel, the message of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, 
In fact, we understand that there is a hell, that God is a just God, and he punishes every sin. And I understand that Christ willingly died and paid the penalty for my sin. And when I, by faith, call upon God to save me because of what Jesus Christ has done, the Holy Spirit regenerates me and gives me a, a new heart. Now, the presence of the Holy Spirit in your heart, in your life, is the evidence that you have been saved. Now, let me ask you a question. How can the third person of the Trinity, God, a very God, indwell you and you not know it? That's not possible. The Bible says, Romans 8 9, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Paul also says in Romans 8 that his spirit witnesses with my spirit that I'm a child of God. He gives me that internal witness, that sense of his presence. Do you sense that this morning? When, when, you, when you sin, it's, it's more than just a guilty conscience. Do you sense the grieving of the Holy Spirit? Do, do you know what it is to be led by the Spirit? Not some kind of weird kind of thing, but, but in your spirit, in your heart, the Holy Spirit, there's that still small voice. There's that sense of his presence in your life. And in a moment here, we'll give you another amazing evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence. So this is the answer to the question. How could these disciples who were fearful fishermen, who all fled from the Garden of Gethsemane, who stood you know, at the cross, except for John, they pretty much stood apart, how is it that these men stood up and gave their very lives to witness to the, of the presence of the resurrected Christ, the reality of his resurrection? How did these men have the power to do that? The same way you and I have the power to live in a culture that is increasingly corrupt, in a culture that increasingly hates God and wants nothing to do with God, and we still have that old nature within us that we struggle with, how can we live the Christian life? How can we obey his commandments? Well, we are enabled to live the Christian life by the Holy Spirit. We're enabled to live the Christian life by the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, he says, I will come to you. A little while longer, the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you will live also. Now those words are full of meaning, and some of that meaning is expanded throughout the New Testament. And some have debated over what he meant by I will come to you. Well, I think primarily it's a reference to the fact that he is going to die, he is going to be buried, but he's going to rise from the dead, and he is going to show himself alive to these very disciples after his resurrection. Because he says there, a little while longer, you will see me. But I think also it's typical of what is true in that he is going back to heaven, but yes, he's coming back to earth one day. That's certainly true as well. But I think the passage is primarily about the fact that they're going to see him after the resurrection. But we know that one day Jesus Christ is coming back to earth and every eye will see him at that day. At verse 20, at that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. In other words, after the resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit, they will have no uncertainties about what Jesus was talking about that night. You know, sometimes Jesus would say things to these men, and it wasn't until later that they really understood what it was that he was talking about. Because remember, John writes this gospel later on, and he's looking back, and he's, he's giving us the words that Jesus said, but then John, because now he has the indwelling Holy Spirit, and the Spirit illuminates the word for him, he can understand what Jesus is talking about. Now, what is this enablement actually? Is it like some kind of electronic surge that goes through your body, or some kind of out-of-body experience, or do you have to meditate and, you know, kind of, you know, chant something, or, or what is this? Well, the enablement is the result of the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's called the filling of the Holy Spirit. In verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. There it is again. If you love me, you keep my commandments. 
The way you show you love me is you keep my commandments. So how, how can we keep his commandments? Now, love and obedience is not the means to salvation. It is the evidence of salvation. Love and obedience is not the means to salvation. It is the evidence of salvation. Because you can't obey the Lord and love the Lord in your natural state because we are sinners and we, we are at enmity against him. But when we get saved, the Holy Spirit indwells us and he gives us that ability to both love God and to obey Jesus. But we're not robots. It's not like we go into some kind of Automon kind of thing. No, the Bible says in Ephesians 5, 17, do not be unwise, understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, some people think the idea is, well, it's sort of like um, filling up a glass of water, but that's a, a, a wrong image here. You receive all the Holy Spirit the day you get saved. Why? Because he's a person, and he doesn't come in parts. He's not, he's not a power. He's powerful, but he's not just a power or some kind of force. He's a person. So the moment you trust Christ as your Savior, according to the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ, and according to what the New Testament teaches us, you are indwelt by the person of the Holy Spirit. And you get the whole person. And he indwells each believer. That's the key evidence that you know you are a Christian. Now, notice the word here, filled, it's used of the wind filling the sails of a ship and moving the ship along is the idea here. So it's really simple. It's the primary New Testament use conveys the sense of dominating influence. It conveys the sense of dominating influence. What is the dominating influence spiritually in your life? Are you controlled by your flesh? Are you controlled by your sin? Now, we all have the sin that easily besets us. I understand that. Everybody has their weak spot, you might say. Even a mature Christian, we are all going to struggle with sin and probably one or two particular sins. But what I'm talking about is what is dominating you. See, the Holy Spirit, when we're filled by the Spirit, it means to be controlled by the Spirit. Paul contrasted to being drunk with wine. When someone is intoxicated, that, that alcohol is controlling them. They'll say things they normally wouldn't say. Sometimes they'll see things they wouldn't normally see. Or they'll certainly do things they wouldn't normally do. It's that kind of an idea. But it's not being out of control. It's being controlled by the Holy Spirit. And it's continuous because the commandment is keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. The pagans believed in Paul's day that if they lost control, it was a sign that the deity was taking over. And so they would get drunk and they would, and, and their, immora, their, their pagan religion always involved some gross immorality. And so they thought by losing control that they, you know, the, the gods have taken me over or whatever. But no, for, for the Christian, it's just the opposite. It's coming under the influence and the control of the Holy Spirit. And don't confuse it with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's a different event that happened when you got saved. To be filled with the Spirit is continuous. It's in the present tense. Keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Keep yielding to the Holy Spirit. Paul says also, walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the sphere of the Spirit. Follow the Holy Spirit. Satan is the one who bangs the drum in your life. The Holy Spirit, most of the time, is that still small voice. It's, it's, that, it's that impression on your spirit to do the right thing, to not do the wrong thing. Do you experience that in your life? Do you even know what I'm talking about? And I don't say that to belittle you or condemn you. I say that to help you identify, do you know the Lord? Have you truly been saved? Do you have that clear sense in your life of the Holy Spirit's presence? You see, you do our, we do our part, God always does his part. I love Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, he writes to this church at Philippi, 
work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, that almost sounds like a work salvation. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, bring your salvation out to the forefront of your life is what he's talking about. Because it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So God is always doing his part through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And we have a part to play in which we yield to the Holy Spirit, in which we make choices with our will. God doesn't destroy our will when we get saved. And so we choose to follow Christ. We choose to obey his commandments. And remember what the Bible says, his commandments are not grievous. So notice what Jesus does here. He established a clear line of demarcation between his disciples and those of the world. And that clear line of demarcation is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so one of the disciples, Thaddeus, um, also known as Judas here, also known as Thaddeus, he asks a question because, you know, the disciples at this point, they don't really comprehend the whole thing, what he's talking about. And so verse 22, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? How will you make known yourself to us in this special way and not unto the world? He was thinking purely in physical terms. So he didn't quite get the spiritual application here. So Jesus makes it a little clearer. Verse 23, he answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Meaning through the presence of the Holy Spirit. He who does not love me does not keep my words. The word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? Jesus said, if you love me, the evidence is you'll keep my word. If you don't love me, you won't keep my word. So here's a good uh, yardstick. How does my life line up with this book? How does your life line up with this book? Do I obey everything in here perfectly? Of course I do. I'm your pastor. Absolutely. No, I don't. I wish I could. I wish I could say that, but I don't. That's my goal, that's my heart, that's what I strive to do. But there are times I sin, there are times I get a wrong attitude, there are times I'm unforgiving, there, there are times I'm impatient, there are times I sin willfully. And when, when that happens, then I have to run to the cross and I have to confess my sin and, and acknowledge again that, yes, I've grieved the Holy Spirit, I'm not losing my salvation. It's just that that close relationship is hindered by sin. Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and... Not do the things which I say. I really love verses like that. It's like Jesus cuts through it all. He says, okay, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things I say? Implication is, stop calling me Lord, Lord, if you're not going to do the things which I say. There's no such thing as just being a Christian in name only. You're not a Christian. You might call yourself a Christian, but obedience is the key. Obedience to God's word is the evidence of a regenerated heart. And how can, and you say, well, that's an ancient book. And, you know, well, Jesus assured us that his word is absolutely rock solid reliable. Verse 25, these things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, here he is again, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. Now, that is a promise for those 11 men in that room that night. That is not a promise for you or me. There is a promise later on in these chapters about the Holy Spirit being the resident teacher who will guide us into all truth. But this is a promise about the, the formation of the Gospels and, and the Bible. Uh, this is a promise that connects to 2 Timothy, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All Scripture is God-breathed. Peter, holy men of God, spoke as they were moved, carried along by the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the inspiration of Scripture. But what he's saying is, you know, these guys didn't have tape recorders or cell phones or they didn't have paper tablets to write down. And how would you even write down all the things that Jesus was saying at that time? How in the world do we know that what John wrote here years after the event is the actual things that Jesus said is because Jesus gave them that promise that through the Holy Spirit, he would inspire scripture. He would bring that to mind so that we know the very words of Christ are here in the gospels. This was a historical event. This is exactly what he said word for word, let alone all of scripture from Genesis to Revelation. 
And then he ends with one more promise, which is really an evidence. One more promise that is really an evidence. He promised his disciples the gift of his peace through the indwelling Holy Spirit. He promised his disciples the gift of his peace through the indwelling Holy Spirit. He says in verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. See, when you begin John chapter 14, Jesus acknowledges the fact that their hearts were troubled because they understand something's coming to a climax here. They don't understand at all, but their hearts are troubled. Isn't it amazing that hours before Jesus suffers incredible, unimaginable suffering, what's on his heart is the, it is the peace of his own disciples? And it wasn't just for them, but, but it was also for us. Francis Schaeffer used to say back in the 70s that most Americans simply want personal peace and affluence. They don't really much care what else happens. You can abort babies. You can kill all these babies. You can do this, do that. If I have personal peace and affluence, I'm fine. I have my own little world here. And, and I think that's probably still true today, probably even more so. But that kind of peace is a circumstantial peace. That's, that's a kind of a even a false peace, you know, false sense of security, and that, that I have my own little world. And that's not what Jesus is talking about here. This is something far deeper. This is a tranquility of soul, a satisfied soul. It's the very peace that Jesus experienced that night. Now, think about this, how amazing this is. In a few hours, what's going to happen? He's going to agonize in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to be arrested and abused. He's going to stand before Pilate. He's going to be humiliated before the crowds. He's going to suffer on the cross. And he's going to be abandoned by his father. And yet he's talking about peace. And he says, I bequeath you my peace that I have right now. Because peace is not the absence of difficult circumstances. And so... Jesus knew that in a few hours he would go to the cross. He would satisfy God's justice. He would purchase our forgiveness. He would provide our righteousness. And he knew that the disciples, what laid before them. Did the disciples have easy lives? (laughs) No, they did not. As far as we know, they all died a martyr's death. Maybe John was the exception, but very likely he too died a martyr's death. And yet he bequeathed to them peace. And that, to me, is one of the great evidences of salvation. Do you have the peace of Christ? Do you know what it is to have that satisfaction of soul? No matter what the circumstances are, your whole life can be falling apart, and you can be facing death, and yet you have this inward, incredible peace. Paul calls it the peace that passes understanding. It passes human comprehension. All of Jesus' disciples are promised the experience of the very peace of Jesus. That's amazing. So do you know what that is? Do you even know what I'm talking about? Do you have that sense of that tranquility of soul? That doesn't mean you never worry or you never get anxious or you never have concerns, but yet deep in your soul, there's that sense of tranquility of soul, that state of peace that only God can give you. That is one of the greatest evidences of your salvation.